Hello, and welcome to the second video in Casey Tree's online advocacy in the district. This class is titled A History of Trees in DC. In this module, we'll be going over how DC was created and how planning made it into the city of trees. Before DC looked like this, it looked like this. While it wasn't actually ever a swamp, Washington DC was built at the confluence of two rivers. This is what gives us the swampy summers DC is famous for. At the time, the area was home to seven indigenous tribes, two of which DC's rivers are named after. The Anacostia River after the Anacostan tribe, and the Potomac River after Patawamac, a Native American village on the river's southern bank. The area was covered in 2,000 acres of wetland surrounded by old growth forest and was rich in natural resources. However, if we fast forward past the settling of new lands, the cutting down of trees for tobacco farming, the Revolutionary War, and America's first and second attempts at a government, we get to 1791. President George Washington has been tasked with finding a location for the new nation's capital. He chooses a valley with rivers and rolling hills not far from his Mount Vernon estate. To design the new capital, Washington hired renowned French planner Pierre L'Enfant. L'Enfant's design of DC was largely influenced by European cities, such as Paris and Versailles, where federal buildings were constructed so as to seamlessly integrate into the largely undeveloped landscape. The result was a system of diagonal avenues superimposed over a grid system that radiated away from the two largest seats of federal power. These buildings were centered around monuments and green spaces and connected by tree-lined streets. In his notes, L'Enfant specified that the avenues should be grand thoroughfares lined with trees to reflect the natural beauty of the surrounding landscape. However, he couldn't do it alone. L'Enfant hired Andrew Ellicott and Benjamin Banneker to survey the new boundaries of the 100 square mile diamond, which would later become the county of Washington and a smaller area within the square that would become the city of Washington, plus the federal core. In the latter part of 1791, the surveyor's roles were complete and L'Enfant was able to begin designing the Washington DC that we see today. But even the best laid plans often go awry and during this process, L'Enfant was relieved of his duties and left, taking all of his plans for DC with him. Luckily, Benjamin Banneker was able to recreate L'Enfant's plans from memory, and DC was finished without a hitch. Unfortunately, the beautiful city that these three architects created did not stay that way for long. The British burned the White House and Capitol building in 1814, and Virginia retroceded part of DC, now Arlington and Alexandria, and the Civil War led to the destruction of many government buildings. By 1864, buildings were being constructed or reconstructed, while DC struggled to find its footing. To make matters worse, high rainfall and being at the confluence of two rivers led to terrible flooding, which you can see in this picture. However, 11 years later, the city was rebuilt and thriving, and the DC governor, yes, DC had a governor back then, not a mayor, Alexander Boss Shepard, began an initiative to clean up the city and improve the quality of life for district residents. Part of this plan included planting 60,000 trees across DC. Planting trees to improve the quality of life is not a new idea for Washingtonians. Unfortunately, the cost of this and other public works and public improvement projects bankrupted the district and resulted in the government being dissolved. Between 1874 and the early 1900s, the district experienced significant growth. The first streetcar began service and the city and county of Washington merged to create the District of Columbia. However, all of this new development to accommodate the expanding city broke up existing green space. In 1901, the Senate Parks Commission, or Macmillan Commission as it was later known, was formed. This body was tasked with reclaiming the city's green space and the resulting plan had the goal of expanding park area beyond the federal core and focused on rebuilding the National Mall, which had become fragmented due to development. It also called for the re-landscaping of the mall and capital grounds, expanding green space west and south of the Washington Monument, consolidating railway crossings, and designing municipal office complexes to merge different government buildings. It was the Macmillan Commission that established a comprehensive recreation and park system, 
and expanded on L'Enfant's original idea to connect neighborhoods through trees and green space. The Macmillan plan was the last big design plan of DC. So what's happened since? 1926, the National Capital Park and Planning Commission was established to develop a comprehensive plan for the park, parkway, and playground systems. 1950, the commission produced the first federal comprehensive plan, which outlined and directed development in the district. 1967, NCPC started considering nature and the environment in planning and added an environmental element to the federal comprehensive plan. 1973, Congress passed the Home Rule Act, creating a DC city government. 1984, DC produced their first comprehensive plan. 1999, Mayor Williams increased the district's tree budget from $3 million to $9 million. 2002, the DC Council passes the Urban Forest Preservation Act. 2012, the district established a 40% tree canopy goal, a goal that we at Casey Trees strive to help them reach. So here we are today, 2.4 million trees strong, 636 local and national parks and monuments, and as of 2021, the best park system in the country. Thank you for watching the second module, A History of Trees in DC. Got any follow-up questions or want to learn more about this topic? Send us an email at friends at caseytrees.org. We hope you enjoyed learning about the history of DC's tree canopy. You may now proceed to module three, DC Political Geography.